Welcome to Literary and Jury Charge Practice. Let's start out with this literary, and it is called Mr. Churchill Had It Right. Ready? Here we go. Gee, Dave, how many times have you taken the CRR test? I have contributed an F in test fees to put up a West Wing at National Headquarters in Vienna. I have contributed an F in test fees to have at the very least a plaque at headquarters with my name emblazoned with solid gold saying, here's a guy who... I took the test over and over and over, at times absolutely brimming with such confidence that I knew, just knew, this is the time, over and over, not to be. I built this test into a three-headed dragon, so big that I began to doubt I would ever slay it. Over and over, 20 seconds, 40 seconds into the test, smooth as glass writing, then the thought would pop into my head, Dave, you're finally getting it. You're home free, boy. Oops. The hands start shaking like I'm afflicted with St. Vita's dance. Soon, smooth as glass during the one-minute warm-up, and then with the words, ready, begin, my hands would start shaking, sometimes just a little. Not good. If you are taking a test that is predicated not just on speed but accuracy, hands that are now allowed to move freely about the cabin are an invitation to abject failure. Sometimes my hands would move so violently, so uncontrollably, that I would just take my hands off the keyboard because I was afraid I would knock the machine over, literally, and ruin the test for others around me. This is with Propendal. That bad, that scary. They don't do that when I'm writing a real-time job. Just this test, this three-headed dragon that I painstakingly manufactured into something it clearly is not. It's a test, for goodness sake, nothing more, just a test. When it came to taking the CRR, in the words of Michael Jackson, I was bad. I was really, really bad. I have taken this test more times than any human being walking the face of this planet. I kid you not. We will get back to that. Let's try this closing argument. Ready? Here we go. In other words, if you see the guy coming in with rain on his jacket, if the only conclusion can be that that's rain, then that's circumstantial evidence. But let's say you live in an apartment building and they are working on some pipes on the roof or the sprinklers are malfunctioning and somebody comes in and they are kind of wet. It doesn't hold up anymore because there is more than one reasonable conclusion. And now listen to this. This is the law. If one reasonable conclusion points to innocence and the other to guilt, you must accept the one that points to innocence. You must. That is the law. In other words, a conclusion. You see a golf cart on the property and you want to think, okay, it's a golf cart on the property. And it's here that day and it wasn't in this picture that day you know, or something that could point to guilt, but according to the law, only if the only reasonable conclusion points to guilt. Then number two, 
if there is any other reasonable conclusions and one of them points to innocent and one points to guilt, you must adopt the one that points to innocence. Now, that's not what the government's attorney was suggesting to you this morning. He was talking about all kinds of circumstantial evidence, but he wasn't talking about other reasonable conclusions that come from that evidence. He was just talking about the one he wants, but that's not the law. By the way, I think the judge will probably read that to you more than once because it's more than once in the instructions. The judge is going to instruct you about witnesses, give you some guidance on judging the credibility of witnesses. One of the things he's going to tell you is a witness's testimony influenced by a factor such as bias and prejudice. If so, what should you do? You look at that very carefully, very carefully if someone is biased or prejudiced. As I indicated before, I think Ms. Richardson was the driving force in this case, and there was no doubt from her testimony up there that she is biased and she is prejudiced, perhaps even hates my client. You could hear her when testimony would go on. I could hear her sighs and her heavy breathing and different things like that as it went on, especially when there would be evidence for or against. That's the kind of thing that the judge is going to tell you to look out for. It was Ms. Richardson, after all that, suggested they go look in the shed. It was Ms. Richardson that found garbage bags with clothes in it. It was Ms. Richardson that contacted the DA and the sheriffs for those three years and finally got them to do a GSR test and then said that my client made some statement at the sheriff's department. She was shot. It's very dramatic. The question is, is it true? Does she have bias? Does she have prejudice? That's for you to decide. Does she have an interest in how the case is decided? Another instruction that the judge will read to you is a defendant has an absolute constitutional right not to testify. And I don't think any one of us would like that to be any other way. We aren't all lawyers. We cannot all know how this works. And to have someone, anyone, your child, an elderly grandmother, whoever gets up on the witness stand and have someone from the government hammer you for two or three hours, we realize that it's not fair to force people to do that. And so in our Constitution, in the First Amendment to our Constitution, the Bill of Rights, we determined that the best way is to not force people to testify. The judge will tell you he or she may rely on the state of the evidence and argue that the people which I'm doing has failed to prove the charges beyond a reasonable doubt. Do not consider for any reason at all the fact that he did not testify. Do not discuss it during your deliberations or let it influence your decision in any way. Now what about the evidence in this case? I was taking notes as the government attorney spoke. The only circumstantial evidence they had was that my client had a motive. The judge will give you an instruction that motive doesn't say one thing or another. You can use it to show a likelihood or you can use it to show not a likelihood of something but in and of itself it doesn't do it. What is the motive again? $25,000. That was the motive. He showed you a piece of paper that said $100,000 estimate, but then on the bill of sale it shows $0. Half of 50 is 25. That's what we are talking about, a 20-year marriage, $25,000. Let's see, if I was the 
government attorney, I'd say that case proved anyone that is going to get $25,000 must have done it. I don't think so. get back to this. Now let's try some more literary practice. This is the article we started on seven tips for court reporters. Here we go. Control your emotions. A court reporter is tasked with preserving the record in a fair and impartial manner. Sensitive topics may be discussed that can be very emotional to the parties and or the witness. As a court reporter, you must remain neutral while preserving the record. It is unprofessional not to mention distracting if you show emotion during a deposition. Please be aware that everyone in the room can hear you laugh and see you cry. Controlling your emotions and your body language is one of the many keys to being an exceptional court reporter. Eating during a proceeding before the deposition commences it may be in your best interest to ask if it will run through the lunch hour. If so, be prepared and eat beforehand. If you have an absolute need or a medical condition, for example, hypoglycemia, then let the attorneys know in advance that you may need to eat a small snack during the deposition. Also, you can remind attorneys that a short 15-minute break during the course of a deposition is good for everyone. Mobile phones. Depositions can be dry and a bit dull, but do not be tempted to surf the web or do other tasks. Even if you are an ex expert at multitasking, checking your phone shows you are not paying full attention and gives the impression that you are not accurately transcribing what is being said. Technology. It is imperative that you have technology that not only looks like it is from this generation, but also functions properly. Time is precious to you and all parties involved. Waiting for a computer to reboot, load, or update is frustrating for all. Sloppy transcripts. Deposition content can be technical in nature. It, if it is a medical malpractice, intellectual property, pharmaceutical matter, or any other highly specialized topic, you will be faced with numerous acronyms and unusual terms. You can always ask for a spreadsheet of terms to ensure accuracy, especially if a party wants a rough draft or next day delivery. Study and familiarize yourself with these terms and pay close attention to what is being said. Do not rush to finish a job. You should put care into your work and take time to research terms and abbreviations that are new to you. Attorneys read and rely on your transcript and they need to be assured that the record is properly preserved. literary practice and this is an article we had started called will the book disappear ready here we go publishers to a large extent 
are getting with the program, but many books are still either not published in ebook e format or are published later than the printed version. Ebook publishing has also seen to share its share of controversy recently, much having to do with pricing. The U.S. Department of Justice has brought an antitrust lawsuit against Apple, Simon & Schuster, Harshe Beck Book Group, Penguin Group, Macmillan, and HarperCollins. It alleges that these companies have collided to fix the prices, colluded to fix the prices of ebooks sold on Amazon, so as to not undercut the prices at Apple's iBook store. One of the unfortunate legacies of Apple co-founder Steve Jobs, as documented in Walter Isaacson's generally flattering biography of him, is his threatening Amazon in 2010 that it wouldn't get ebooks from big publishers if it didn't go along with Apple's pricing model. Over the past couple of years, in fact, the price of many ebooks has increased from the $10 range to the $14 range. Some ebooks, to the bewilderment or outrage of many ebook aficionados, cost more than the hardback version and sometimes even more than the paperback version when the cost to produce the ebook version is significantly less. Get back to that. Let's try some more of our closing argument. Ready? Here we go. So what do we have? Let's look at what some of these witnesses said. I'm going to start with Ms. Guerra. She was here today, and she's fresh in your minds. Who is Ms. Guerra? She was or is, I'm sorry, I'm going to date myself because I still say secretary sometimes, and I apologize. I believe they are now administrative assistants. She's an administrative assistant to the sheriff. Back in the day when this happened, she was an administrative assistant, apparently, for Mr. Penrod. She had run into my client before and his wife, and she comes out of her room, and she sees him, and she says, Oh, how are you doing, Mr. Concepcion? He says, Fine, and she says, Where's your wife? Oh, she was shot. I mean, she died. And she doesn't have one memory of that. She doesn't have one memory of that. Now the government tries to say, well, yeah, she's probably seen people all over the years. She has a lot of people coming into their office. How many of them come into her office and say, my wife was shot? How many come into her office and say, my wife is dead? the one you met before, and then just have small talk. She didn't remember that because it probably didn't happen. Who is the evidence that that happened? Gina Richardson. Now, Mr. Maxey was there, but notice when we asked Mr. Maxey the questions, he couldn't remember anything other than that one statement. Was it in 12? Was it in 13? Was it two days after? Was it five days after? And I said, Mr. Maxey, did you have a conversation with the government attorney this morning before you testified? Yeah. Did you talk about this? Yeah, all right. We put him on the stand. What can he remember? He cannot remember anything except, oh yeah, I do remember that she said a statement like this. He couldn't remember what year it was. He couldn't remember anything else that was said. He had a hard time even remembering that they went there or who else was there. But he was talking to people who wanted him to say something. 
when he got on the stand and he did remember his cue. He did remember his one line, but Ms. Guerra is not the same kind of a person, Mr. Maxey said. I said, Mr. Maxey, isn't it true that one of the deputies let it slip that there was a shooting? And he said, yes, he let it slip and he's not even around as much as my client. He lives clear down. I can't remember the town, but it wasn't close by. He's not the one that's getting phone calls to come on in and this and that and the other and talking to the deputies and everything, but they let it slip to him. All right, that will conclude our literary and jury charge practice.